All right, what we're going to study in this video is antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. All right, so by now you should be very good at evaluating derivatives. For example, if I give you the function x squared, well, you should know right away that the derivative of that function will be given by 2x. But now, what about the inverse process? So if I give you the same function x squared, but instead of calculating the derivative, I ask you what function, capital F of x, is such that its derivative gives you back x squared. So it's such that f prime of x is equal to little f of x, which is x squared. Right, so this is the inverse question. Instead of starting with a function and calculating its derivative, I'm now asking what function is such that its derivative gives you a given function. Well, this inverse process has a name. It is called calculating an antiderivative of a function. So more precisely, a function capital F is called an antiderivative of F on an interval i if the derivative of capital F of x is equal to f of x for all x on the interval. So in my previous example, if I start with the function f of x equals to x squared, then I can calculate an antiderivative relatively easily. So it's easy to convince yourself that this function here, one third of x cubed, is an antiderivative of x squared, because if I calculate the derivative, so d capital F dx, well, what will I get? I have to use the power rule. The threes cancel, and I end up with x squared, which is indeed the function I started with. So this capital F of x here is an antiderivative of x squared. All right, but then what about the following functions? Instead of taking this one, I'll take one third of x cubed plus five. Is it still an antiderivative of x squared? Well, yes, it is, because if I calculate the derivative of the right-hand side here, because the derivative of a constant is always zero, I'm still going to get x squared. And in fact, I could add any constant here, right? I could take one third x cubed plus phi or anything. In fact, this can be, this could be an arbitrary constant c, and I would still get an antiderivative. So it looks like this inverse process is not uniquely defined, right? There's a whole family of antiderivatives that you can get, and they all differ by addition of a constant. constant. Okay, so I can summarize this in the following statement. If capital F is an antiderivative of little f on some interval i, then the most general antiderivative of f and i is going to be capital F plus an arbitrary constant c. So it is standard notation here to use the capital letter c to denote this arbitrary constant for the general antiderivative of a function. All right, so let me now give you a general argument of why, uh, for why this is true. So suppose that I have two antiderivatives of the same function. So suppose that capital F of x and capital G of x are both antiderivatives of a function little f of x. All right, so what does that mean? That means that capital F prime of x will be equal to f of x, and that capital G prime of x is also equal to f of x. Okay, and now consider a new function, capital H of x, which will be the difference of these two. So what do I know about this, fun this new function? Well, the one thing I know is that the derivative of capital H of x will be the difference in the derivatives of capital F of x and capital G of x. But by definition, these are just the same. They're both equal to little f of x. So in other words, the derivative of capital H of x is zero. Now, what uh, function is such that its derivative is zero? Well, any constant will satisfy this condition. So here, I will conclude that H of x can be any constant, but h of x, remember, is the difference between f of x and g of x. So you conclude from there that f of x is equal to g of x plus a constant. So in other words, any two antiderivatives of the same function will differ by addition of a constant, which is the statement here. Now, this is not really a formal proof, because here I'm, I'm using the statement here that uh, derivatives of the constant is zero, which is certainly true. But how do I know that only the constant functions are such that their derivatives are zero? This is not so obvious, and in fact, we don't know yet. If we fill the gap here in this proof, I would need to use the mean value theorem, which we will see very shortly. 
But meanwhile, this is just a general argument for why any two antiderivatives of the same function will always differ by addition of a constant. All right, so antiderivatives are really fundamental to calculus, so we need to introduce uh, some notation for them. So we're going to use the following notation. This is a symbol which is some elongated kind of s. This is called an integral sign. And this expression here is called the indefinite integral of f. What it means is really that you're taking the most or the general uh, antiderivative of f, so namely pick an arbitrary antiderivative and add an arbitrary constant to it. All right, so for example, if I go back to my example in the previous slide, so when I calculated the antiderivative of the function x squared, I would write this expression here, which means that uh, I'm calculating the uh, general antiderivative of f of x. So the answer here would be what I calculated, one-third x cubed plus an arbitrary constant c. Constant is very important here when you evaluate indefinite integrals, you always have to add this arbitrary constant here. Okay, and the notation here, as I said, this symbol means finding the general antiderivative of f of x, just as this symbol means finding the derivative of f of x. So these are inverse processes. All right, so now that we've defined the antiderivatives and indefinite integrals, we can try to evaluate those. And since we know this is an inverse process to differentiation, one thing we could do is try to undo all the differentiation rules that we've seen. So let me start with a constant multiple rule and a sum rule. So the inverse statement to the constant multiple rule is the statement that the integral of a constant times a function is the same as the constant times the general antiderivative of that function. And similarly for the sum rule, statement is that the general antiderivative of the sum of two functions is the same as the sum of the antiderivatives. I'm going to prove now the first statement. I'm not going to prove the second one, but the proof goes along a very similar line. All right, so to prove it, well, let me introduce some notations. I'm going to call the general antiderivative of the function f of x, capital F of x, plus an arbitrary constant. All right, so if I multiply this by a constant c, what do I get? On the right-hand side, I get c times capital F of x, plus c times capital C. But I can rewrite the second term here just as, say, capital D, because this is just an arbitrary constant times a constant, so it's still an arbitrary constant. All right, so this is now what I get by multiplying uh, the general antiderivative of the function f of x by c. But if I take the derivative of this, what will I get? Well, the derivative of the right-hand side here, what will this give me? That just gives me c times the derivative of capital F of x, because the derivative of a constant is zero. But by definition, capital F of x is an antiderivative of little f of x, so I get c f of x, right? So in other words, what I've just concluded here is that c times capital F of x plus d is the general antiderivative to the function c times f of x, which is exactly the statement here, right? So the statement here is that this expression here means the general antiderivative of c times f of x, and I've just calculated that this is equal to c times the general antiderivative of the function f of x. All right, so that's pretty straightforward, and you can do a very similar proof for the sum rule. So another rule that we can try to undo is the power rule. By the way, whenever I state uh, that an indefinite integral is equal to something, you can always check whether this is correct very easily. So what you can do is just check by differentiation. So what it means is that you can always differentiate the right-hand side, and you should recover the integrand. The integrand is the thing inside the integral sign here without the dx. So if I differentiate the right-hand side, I should recover that. That's always going to be true. That's by definition of an antiderivative. All right, so this is now the general statement that undoes the power rule, because if you look at the right-hand side, so if I take the derivative of the right-hand side, what will I get? Well, for the first term by the power rule, I get n plus 1 times x to the n, and the derivative of a constant is 0. The n plus 1 terms cancel, so I end up with x to the n, which is indeed the integrand here. So what this is saying is that this is the general antiderivative of this function. But that's only valid for n not equals to minus 1, because of course this expression here is not defined for n equals to minus 1, I would get 1 over 0 here. So what actually happens for n equals to minus 1? Well, what function is such that its derivative is equal to x to the minus 1 or 1 over x? The logarithm. 
Yeah, so if you look at the indefinite integral or the general antiderivative of 1 over x, you don't have a power function, you end up with a logarithmic function. And you can check that this is true just by taking the derivative of the right-hand side. So the derivative of the natural logarithm is just 1 over x, so indeed you recover the integrand here. Now there's a subtlety here, which is that I have absolute values here. Uh, I need to have the absolute values when I evaluate the integral here because I'm uh, interested in the general antiderivative. So x does not have to be positive here, so I, I need to look at the case where I take the absolute value of x. But it's a good exercise to show that this is fine in the sense that the derivative of the log of absolute value of x is indeed equal to 1 over x, just as the derivative of the natural log of x for positive x was also equal to 1 over x. So this is fine. This is the most general antiderivative of 1 over x. One other thing which is interesting to note here is that if you look at the derivatives of uh, logarithms in other bases, they will not give you some kind of other formula for antiderivatives because they would only multiply this integral here by a constant. So that's another example that uh, when you talk about logarithms, logarithms, you can really reduce everything to the natural logarithm. You don't really have to deal with other bases. Other differentiation rules that we've seen, exponential functions. We've seen that the derivative of, the, of e to the x is e to the x itself, so the general antiderivative of e to the x is also e to the x plus a constant. Right? This follows because the derivative of the right-hand side will give you back the integrand, while for the case of uh, another base, slightly more complicated, the integral or the general antiderivative of a to the x will be a to the x over natural log of a plus a constant. This again, follow, again follows by taking the derivative of the right-hand side, so if I take the derivative here, I'll get 1 over natural log of a times natural log of a times a to the x. So I just get a to the x. So indeed, this is the general antiderivative of a to the x. Another set of functions that we studied are trig functions. So we've calculated derivatives of trig functions. We can undo these rules to get a antiderivatives for a bunch of trig functions. For example, for example, the antiderivative of sine of x is minus cos of x plus c, because the derivative of minus cos of x will give me minus minus sine of x, which gives me back sine of x. Similarly for the antiderivative of cos of x, now here I have the antiderivative of secant square of x, which is tan of x plus c, because the derivative of this right-hand side gives me back secant square of x. Similarly for cosecant square of x, and also for secant tan, cosecant cotan. Now note that this does not give you the integral of, a, of an arbitrary trig function, right? If I ask you to calculate the general antiderivative to tan of x, the x, well, we can calculate that using these rules. We don't know yet what this is. In fact, we'll learn that in a few weeks. One last set of functions that we studied are inverse trig functions, so we can also undo these differentiation rules to get rules for calculating antiderivatives. For example, the general antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1 will be the inverse tan of x, plus a constant, and similarly for the inverse sine and inverse secant. Note that we don't need to include the inverse cotan, inverse cosine, and inverse cosecant here, because uh, the integrals on the left-hand side would only differ by a minus sign, so this would not give us new information. All right, so one thing you may wonder right now is why I did not include the product rule, quotient rule, and the chain rule to undo to get uh, rules for calculating antiderivatives. Well, we can do that, but it's actually more complicated, so we will do that later on. Uh, these will become what we call integration by parts, and also substitution technique for evaluating integrals. So we will see those in the next few weeks and in the next semester. All right, so that's a lot of new rules for calculating antiderivatives, but they're really just the same as the differentiation rules, just formulated in the inverse way. So uh, to remember all of those, I, I, put, I, I made a nice table, which is in the summer sheet. So you can look at the summer sheet right now or later on when you need it, and just use that to remember all the rules for evaluating antiderivatives. Let me now, now work through a few examples. So just to give you an idea of how it goes. So if I ask you to calculate the integral, the general antiderivative of, say, t to the 5 over 8, dt, what is this? Well, then first you can use the fact that you can pull the constant out, so you end up with 1 over 8 t to the 5 dt, and then you use the fact that you know what is the what function is such that it's derivative of t to the 5, because it's just undoing the power rule. So what will I get? Well, I'll get 1 over 6 t to the 6 
plus an arbitrary constant. Now I can simplify this slightly, so I end up with 1 over 48 t to the 6 plus an arbitrary constant. Right, that's cool. One thing you can always do, as I said, is that you can check your answer by differentiating. Differentiating. How would that go? What does that mean? Well, you take the derivative of your answer and you check that you recover the integral. And if you don't, that means you made a mistake. So the derivative here gives me what? 148 over 48 times 6 t to the 5. Then if I simplify, 6 over 48 should give me 1 over 8 t to the 5, which is indeed the integrand. So that's good. So my answer is correct. So you can check or you can always make sure that your answer is correct just by differentiating your answer. Very important as well. Don't forget the integration constant here, the arbitrary constant. That's very important. If you don't put it, if you don't write it down, you will lose marks. All right, let me give you a second example. Suppose I want to calculate the general antiderivative of x minus 3x squared over square root of x dx. Now, at first, that looks kind of complicated because what I'm asking here is to find a function which is such that its derivative is equal to this complicated expression. That's not obvious. But let me first simplify the integrand here, and we'll see that we can actually evaluate that. Well, first, what I can do is just divide both terms here by square root of x, which is just x to the 1 half. So I end up with the first term, which will become x to the 1 half minus 3x to the 3 half dx. All right, and now I can use the inverse of the sum rule that says that the integral of a sum is the sum of integrals. So I end up with the statement that this is the integral of x to the 1 half dx minus, and I'll pull the constant outside the integral as well, right? And then I can just evaluate these two integrals because these are just uh, power rules, right? They're just power functions. I'm just looking for a power function, which is such that its derivative gives you back this expression. So for the first case here, I'll get 1 over 3 half x to the 3 half minus 3, and then I get 1 over 5 half x to the 5 half, plus my arbitrary constant of integration. And of course, I can simplify the expression. I get 2 thirds x to the 3 half minus, now if I bring that upstairs, I get 6 over 5 x to the 5 half, plus an arbitrary constant of integration. And now you can check that if you differentiate this expression, indeed you recover the original integrand, so your answer is correct. Let me now give you a last example, which is a little more subtle. Suppose that you want to calculate the general antiderivative of cosine of 2x dx. So I'm looking here for a function which is such that its derivative gives me back cosine of 2x. Well, if I want to get a cosine, then my function should be a sine, right? So you could guess that this should be sine of 2x. But that's not quite right, because if you take the derivative of sine of 2x, you have to use the chain rule. Right, you'll get indeed cosine of 2x, but times the derivative of the inner function, which will be 2. So you'll get 2 cosine of 2x. So how can I get just cosine of 2x? One way to do it is just to multiply by 1 half. Right, and then I have to add my arbitrary constant of integration. All right, and then you can check whether this makes sense. So you just, to check that this is correct, you just have to calculate the derivative of the right-hand side, see whether you recover the integrand. So if I do that, what will I get? So I get 1 half times the derivative of sine of 2x, which is cos of 2x, times 2, which is indeed cos of 2x. So it works. So this is the answer for this indefinite integral. Now this is a little more subtle because I kind of had to undo the chain rule. There's a kind of formalism to do that, a more formal way of doing it, which is called substitution, and we will learn that in the next few weeks. All right, so let me end this video by going back to physics. So suppose that you know the position function of an object, how do you get the velocity function for that object? Well, we know how to do that. We just take the derivative, or in other words, we differentiate the position function. And what we've defined in this video is the inverse process. So that should give us the position function from the velocity function by taking the antiderivative or the indefinite integral. So we call that integrating. This is all very cool, but remember from the first week, that I argued that to get the distance travel or position function from the velocity function, what, what, what we had to do was completely different. Namely, what I argued is that you had to calculate the area under the graph of the velocity function. 
This is completely different from just undoing differentiation rules, right? So it's a completely different entity. In fact, this process here that we study in this video is called indefinite integral. Uh, this idea of calculating the area under the graph is called a definite integral, and they're actually completely different entities. But of course, they must be closely connected because they're doing the same thing. And the connection is the essence of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which obviously is fundamental to calculus. So that's very, very important. So we will study this theorem shortly, but what we need to do first, and that's what we're going to do in the next videos, is study uh, how you can define these definite integrals or this calculation of the area under the graph of a function more rigorously so that we can relate it to antiderivatives through the fundamental theorem of calculus.